They just evolve. They, they come from within. I was lucky to have great teachers who encouraged me to, but it was more in the inner exploration, teachers of the inner world. And by doing that, it empowered me to do my work because especially women's voices are so not heard. Right. And that's the thing that sustains me now because, you know, if people don't, for music, if people don't know what category you're in, God help you, there's no bin for you, there's no label. Do you know, and I just know it's almost a political act for me to do my work because women's voices are traditionally not heard. I mean, and Yoko Ono talks about love and envisioning world peace. And I don't think that's naive. You know, I think we have to hold that vision. And I think it's the artists and the visionaries who weave the world back together. And sound artists, you know, uni music is a universal language. Right. It creeps under the door of politics. It just does. <laughs> Oh, I was a failure at being normal. I couldn't be anything but what I was. Right. You know, my heart wasn't in it. You know, I just had to follow my heart, you know, the path with heart. I had to do that. I mean, luckily I'm from the 60s. So the 60s, you know, and my generation is Pluto and Leo. We have to be who we are. That's our job. Moms come to me. It, it works differently now. In the old bread woman days, the melodies would come to me and I would have actual pictures of what I was singing. So, I mean, not literal translations, but I kind of knew, oh, this is a song about seeing an old friend or this is a song about going somewhere beautiful. There's one song um, that's like a water. I could see water and flowers kind of circling in the water. So I knew... Um, kind of the where of the song, like the location of the song. But now, because I work as a, with the improvise, as an improviser with other people, it just, the sounds come out and they're provoked mostly by the sounds I hear. Oh, okay. So like a loop, I'll hear a loop and then I'll know instantly a melody will come. My everything. It's my everything. But it, it doesn't come from an intellectual place, so I can't really answer the, that question. It's so part of me. And when I'm lucky, it touches other people. I started to yeah. sing at first. I listened to ethnic women from all over the world. I listened to Bulgarian women. I listened to Burundi women. I listened just to tribal cultures, not to copy them, but just to find myself. Because this language came to me when I was literally driving in my car and I started to sing in this language that just came out of me. It was like a cellular language and it was so natural it didn't seem strange and I was driving, I wasn't in a trance, right. you know. But every time it was, it was something that was really happening to me. It was like my cells were singing in this... Um, very familiar, these melodies were so familiar to me and I just kept doing it and because my background's in anthropology I would tape record it, I would document it. I started to write down with a series of dashes and the syllables so I could remember them but then I could never remember them so I had to record them. So I would just... All my toys, some of my toys 
that I used in performances. And they're really basically simple things. This is one of my favorite objects. It's packing tape and it makes very delicious crunch. of little red plastic elephants that I got in Belgium at the flea market. And they also have a very nice sound. This is a pocket thermon. It's probably one of the few um, technologically advanced objects I own. I'm a collector. I'm basically a collector. Oh, okay. And because I've done performance art for so many years, I always look for something I could use in a piece. But since, when did I start really? I guess in the late 80s and early 90s, I started performing as a singer, as a vocalist. Okay. But that was never, I never thought I was going to be a vocalist. Oh. I was a shock. Oh. <laughs> so, I had I started really f focusing on um, interesting objects and their sound making properties. These these are bottles from the Pharmacia Poetica, and this was a project that I've been doing for 21 years. This April, and the Pharmacia came to me when I had the chicken pox in 1987 and I was trying to think of the connection between my work, the visual work, you know, which was then the bed sculptures and the language I was singing in, which was bed language. So it was the bed and bread. And I had done a performance downtown called the search for the letter R, because the R was the thing that connected everything. You know, the bread, the bed. So, shortly after doing my performance, I came down with the chicken pox and I was in quarantine for six weeks. And I had nothing to do but think about my work, you know, and what it was about. And, and I saw that my work was really involved with the trans, transforming the literal into the lyrical. And I had always been a collector and I started, and I'd always been interested in languages. So I started collecting small objects as you can see and bottling them. I felt this need to bottle and contain things. And I can't really tell you why I did it. I didn't do it with a theory. None of my work has come from theory. It comes from intuition. But the pharmacy just grew and grew, and I've done it in different countries. I've bottled cities. i bottled Santa Monica. It's sort of like a cross between an alchemist and a urban anthropologist. Santa Monica the pharmacy for the Santa Monica Festival a few years back. But this was from an earlier pharmacia, and it's, see, it's kind of, it's got a clock piece in it, and it's moldy. It has its own little life. It's got a whole little life inside. So it's like a world in a bottle, an ocean in a bottle. Someone in Amsterdam said to me, it's like things being born and things dying. You know, it's the idea of the ocean in the bottle or the genie in the bottle. I mean, that's just totally, it's simplifying. This is like a huge process, huge explorations. And what comes out is the art object. So I'm, it sounds almost fast, you know, fast when I'm talking about it, but it, 
I studied, I mean, I've been reading The Alchemist, Jungian Psychology, Latin, you know, just just investigating, and I think that's probably the anthropologist in me, just like digging through layers of stuff. You know how everyone has a great work? Yeah, right. I think mine's my pharmacy. Because at different times it had stories, you know, it's, it's, this is just the bottle aspect. See, this is from the sand, this is cardboard from the, um, from Santa Monica. But it's better if you don't know what it is. It's more interesting. Because you can imagine when I first did the pharmacy, um, I did it in a storefront. First it was a radio play, then it was in a little storefront in Hollywood, a little gallery. And I actually was in the gallery prescribing sounds, prescribing things for people. So I would have like a white room and a blue room. But it's had, in different places, it's had different forms. What do I want to say about the cures? It's not so much like you have to be sick to go to the pharmacy. It's just like an adjustment of attitude. It's like a shift in perception. That's the main point of it. Um, and I think the meaning of all my work is how just to find the secret life of objects or things, to find those added dimensions. You know, to create, if it's an installation, to create a space where a kind of imaginary alchemy can take place. And I, I think really good art does that. Like art that's trans, what's the word, transportive? It transports yeah. you out of time, you know, into some yeah, other dimension. Yeah. That's really transformational art, I think. And that's the kind of art that moves me. In Switzerland, there are bottles. In Belgium, there are bottles, mostly in Cologne, in my friend's basement. I mean, someday I would love to do a tour and just collect everything. These are the lips, and they've been living here as long as I have. And they were part of a performance I did where I gave a lecture about the lips. And the lips, I for the lips, I spoke entirely in a made-up language. So it was, So people understood me. Um, and at the end I said, read my lips. I did a piece with the hands. It's called the hands and the lips. And then, yeah, Neil Taylor painted these hands. In the 80s, I did a lot of pieces with hands, and I collect hands. And so when you said... This is a prop from a performance done at the Laguna Art Museum called Circus Moon. And this was a collaboration with Sherry Galke and Deborah Oliver and Ruth Ann Anderson. And my piece was in a small room called Luna Remembers. And this is the moon book. What is it exactly? Bubble wrap. But I love this book. <laughs> this is an example of found art with hair samples. I did a series of blonde hair. See, if I had met you, when I was doing my series, I would have asked for a lock of your hair. Ei na vara 
ακούει αυτά για βάκαρα.